different ways, but it's more about you, right? So how do you basically uh, deliver results? And when, when I had to basically think about this and what I learned on the way and what I'm using now, I basically divided the areas I want to talk about into three buckets, which is your brain is your USP. And don't ever forget that. Breaking down what value actually means because value and impact can easily just be buzzwords that people are throwing around. And then the last one is recognizing that you are not a one-man show. And I will break down further what I mean by that. But let's start talking about like the first spot, which is basically your brain is your USP. And your brain is a muscle. And you've heard that so many other times. But it's so important to remember that your brain, as any other muscle in the brain, needs constant training, right? And it doesn't need constant, like rapid sprints of high intensity it needs slow but constant training if you think about how bodybuilders get big they don't get big by going to the gym and working out for eight hours straight once a week no they have to go to the gym consistently and that's because they're building up this routine and the same goes for your brain so when you're looking at your brain as your usp you are only as good as the routine that you're offering your brain for con cons consistent development Right. And if you want to break down your routine, we should talk about the basics. We need to get down to the basics of how the brain actually works and what you need to ensure. Then the next one is uh, one of uh, the favorite, favorite one of mine, which is basically don't copy routines. We're all unique individuals. Your brain is your USP. You don't get gain anything from copying exactly a routine that you've read about that Jeff Bezos uses or or Elon Musk or who, whoever it is. And last one is reflect and optimize, right? So even though you feel like you build a good routine, it's good to take a step back and realize what is working, what is not working, what can I do better and what should I basically uh, either improve on or remove completely. So if we look at the basics, and this is by no means, again, like a proven concept that you can find in any book, but there is basically this productivity pyramid that I've kind of followed very closely. And the fundamentals here are the one I want to focus on, right? Sleep, food, and exercise. And they seem like such basic concepts, but they're such a differentiator for you and anyone else, right? So just having like a regular exercise regime making sure that you eat correctly, that you don't just eat pizza and burgers and so on, that you eat healthy and also recognize what, you know, what works for you. So me personally, for example, when it comes to food and lunch, for example, I use lunch as a break, as, a, as an outlet of like getting away from my desk and kind of breathe and talk with my colleagues about things outside of work. But I also know that for my lunch, I will never ever go for any pasta dish. Because what happens is that I get like this food coma and I won't be productive for an hour to two hours after I've eaten. And then sleep. And sleep is like one of these things that has been, been become kind of a luxury in like this, like, you know, rise and grind hustle culture where everybody is like, okay, you gotta like, you gotta work for 16 hours a day. You're gonna work for 20, 20 hours a day. No. Like your brain needs to function properly, so you need to get the right amount of sleep. And that's different, again, from all of us. Some just need six, some need eight, some need nine. But you need to figure out what you need to be working optimally. And it, like, this makes sense if you also want to just look at it from, a, from you know, many of your students, right? There's a reason why the things that you learn on a Friday, like that you don't learn that well when you've been out drinking Thursday evening. Right. And that is basically because you're hungover, but it's also because alcohol significantly impairs you for your good sleep. So it's important to always think about the basics, right? Am I making sure to eat? Am I exercising? Am I getting enough sleep? And they seem like such basic concepts, but they're critical. And of course, we have all the others in psychology and details, and we can always, and I'll touch upon those later. Next one, right? Don't copy routines. And I've just taken three images here of un entrepreneurs and moguls within each of their industry. Everybody knows Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos makes sure that he makes breakfast for his children every morning at eight, because that's what he gets as family time, right? That's a routine of his. 
Daniel Ek, who is the guy in the middle who founded Spotify and still the CEO of it, he doesn't start his workday until 10.30 because he knows that he needs to go for a run before to work optimally. Elon Musk makes sure that he gets six to six and a half hours of sleep every single day because he's figured out if he gets less than that, he is unproductive. And again, that doesn't mean that you need to start your day at 10.30, that you only need six to six and a half hours sleep. These are just examples of none of these guys have the same routine. Even though they're all, you know, revered billionaires, they're all massive, massively successful, they're not following another routine. And lastly, right, reflect and optimize. And this is just a screen grab from my calendar. But again, I want to highlight, don't copy routines. But for me to work, work properly and what I figured out is that I need to start my day first drilling down what is my plan for today? What are the my must wins? What do I need to have accomplished today? What are you know, nice wins and what are dream wins, right? So I break it down to like, this is something I need to have done today. This is something that would be nice to have finished today. And this is something that if I have the energy, if I have the motivation, I will do this. Then I have, and of course that's a reflection, right? I need to reflect up over my day and I need to optimize my day. Then I start my day afterward with kill the beast. And that's a term that I've kind of used to describe that one task that you kind of hate. It's that one email that you have to send to a client or a customer or a partner or someone else that you've been kind of dreading for one reason or the other. It can be like this one admin task that you've kind of postponed. It can be like this one invoice that you haven't paid. That is where that moment is. That's where I kill the beast because that means that I will have a sense of achievement for the rest of the day in any way. And then the most important one is the one you see on Friday afternoon at 3 p.m., which is weekly reflection. And again, this is where the reflect and optimize really comes in, where my focus here is I'm breaking down how has my week been? Do I feel good about the week that has just passed? Do I feel bad about it? And why? Is there anything I should change? Is there any task that I should have postponed to the other week? What has been draining my energy and what gave me energy? And constantly figuring out, okay, I remember like around, you know, Wednesday before before noon, I was not really functioning. I didn't really were as productive as I were yesterday. What could have caused that? It's like, oh, okay, what could have caused that would basically be like I watched the football match too late in the evening yesterday, so I didn't really get my sleep. Or, you know, did I start the day out wrong by having the wrong meeting? Did I not do my to-do correctly? Whatever it is. And then figuring out what works, what doesn't, and then optimizing it. And again, we're just talking about your brain still, right? You need to figure out what is the routine that works for you. Like if this works for you on a Monday morning, you know, and then reflect on the week past or reflect on like the, the month past it, that's what you need to do. But it's important to always reflect on these kind of things. So when we've talked about your brain being the USP, we're also, you know, talking about, first of all, it needs to be optimized. You need to make sure to get the fundamentals in place. You need to not copy just what you've read in the book and you need to figure out what works. And the only way you can figure that out is by reflecting on it yourself. I think a lot of us, and I see this happening. I saw this happening in Google. I saw this happening in Rocket Internet. I see it happening in Swapi. Is that you will like, you will chase the ball like a like a like a dog, right? You will run in the hamster wheel. Like there's always the next task. There's always the next task. So you rarely spend time on actually reflecting. Well, what should I actually do with these tasks? Do they actually make sense? Uh, like why am I even doing these tasks? And can I do them better? So after you've spent some time reflecting, that also kicks in when you need to understand what value actually means. And in this case, I want to break down the value of both, let's say, the company that you're working with or whatever organization it is, and then basically look at afterwards as well of like, how do you understand value? And how do you bring value to that organization? So to give you an example of that, I will highlight one of the first things I was taught inside Google and what I've always learned is to break it down to its core value, right? 
Not, no bullshit, no fluff. What is the actual value that you're bringing? And let's look at Google here as an example. So you hear this in the media a lot. Google's value is that they're selling consumer data. And if you're saying that Google's value is consuming data, you're absolutely wrong. Because Google is not selling consumer data. That is what, you know, that is one of their core, uh, you know, attributes. That's why they're do what they're doing is working so well is because they have all this data. So they're not selling consumer data. Well, Google is then offering up an advertisement platform, right? Google ads, that's their main revenue driver. But that is not really what value they drive. Yes, they offer an advertising platform. Yes, it's working, but that's not the value of Google. No, the value of Google is basically intent. If you break it down, Google knows your intent. And if you think about it, it you, can, you can break it down even further, right? So Google understands your intent, which it's, that is the value that it's bringing to its customers, the companies, that it understands your intent. Every time you're searching for something, you're bringing about an intent. And of course you're thinking, well, you're just talking about Google search right now. But no, if you're thinking about it, like the second biggest search engine in the world is not Bing, it's YouTube. Because YouTube also has a search function. Everybody uses the search function in YouTube. It shows that you have an intention to watch a specific video about whether it's where you want to travel or if, whether it's you want to be entertained or whatever it is. Google Maps is the third biggest search engine in the world. It shows your intent to go somewhere, whether that's a restaurant or a store or you need to go to work or meet someone. That is, again, you showing your intent. So basically, you need to bring down everything that a company organization is about and bring it down to what is the actual value. And can you sum it up in like one sentence or one word? Because as soon as you have that value, then you understand, you know, your value in this machine. And this seems like a very basic slide. And I'm also going to elaborate a bit further on it, right? There is, you're getting pulled into this machine or this company where basically you're saying, this is your, your offer, a job position. Here's your core goal. Go for it. Right. Your core goal is also something you need to understand, right? Is it to bring in revenue? Is it to optimize the cost? Is it to optimize the profit? Is it to boost customer retention? Is it to build brand equity? Whatever it is, right? Break it down to what are your core goals? And it doesn't necessarily need to be one goal. It can be more, but you need to have like the core value of it. And then you basically deliver an input. Right? That's your time spent working. That's your task that you're doing. And then the output is basically should be your core goals. It's, it's, it's all about breaking down complex things to its simplicity. So when we look at your input into this and you've been working, let's say, in a company for a, couple, for a month or something, or you've started working, you build your own business and you started looking back at, again, reflecting and optimizing, you reflecting on you know, what have I done? What tasks have I done, basically? And the way I like to categorize them is very simply high value tasks, low value tasks, and the unavoidables. So high value tasks are all of these tasks that I find that I have a passion for, right? That I really like to do it because I, I agree to this one. So for me right now, Swappy, it is doing market research, making strategic choices about what to do, making pricing strategies depending on on what works and what doesn't, right? So all of these tasks that you, you know, we all have them when we work or when we study, it's like we have this passion of like, oh, this is really cool. This is something I can spend more time on because I'm getting energy from it. Those are the high value tasks that you should be doing and the company would love for you to do more of because you're putting in an extra effort. Remember the company is on your side in the same situation. They want you to perform at your maximum as well. Then you have the low value tasks. This can be menial tasks that you don't really find any energy from. It can be basic tasks. It can be tasks where you're like just constantly, constantly hitting a wall where you're like you're not really progressing that much. And every time you finish doing this one task, you're completely drained of energy. For me at Swapy, for example, it's it's doing some of the creative work that we have to do or designing the creative strategy for something or discussing or or negotiating with influencers. I, I hate it. I, I can't stand doing those tasks. So 
what I what you can do here is, which is what I'll break down, is like what can you do about these tasks? And then you have the unavoidables. And when I mentioned the unavoidables, these are tasks that are typically related to admin work, right? These are tasks that are neither high value, you know, they, they might be low value ta ta tasks, they might be high value tasks, they might be neither, it might just be a no value task, but you ha basically have to do it. It is if you're hourly, you know, if, if you're billing the client on an hourly weight or like an hourly billing structure, then it's recording your hours that you spent with that client. Or it can be, you know, you reporting on last week's performance of whatever you're reporting on, right? These are tasks that needs to be done. They're not really bringing any value to you, but they're bringing value to some part of the organization, but you just have to do them. So basically what I want to focus on here is the low value tasks, right? Because when you look at a low value task, whatever it is in your day, whether it, it could also just be a task that provides a lot of value for, for the company, but you have no comp, like you don't feel you have the competency to do it or it just drains your energy. So basically the first choice you have is continue, continue the task as is. This we don't want to do. We never want to do this. It's suboptimal, it's not working for you, it's not working for anyone. The next one you have is to kill it. Does this task that I'm doing or this thing that I'm doing inside the company or inside or studying or whatever, does it actually make sense? Like stepping back, does it make sense that I'm doing this? Yes, I might be spending five hours on something, but it might deliver the, a minuscule result. Why should I spend time on it? So that again, taking the step back and looking at it and saying, okay, I actually don't need to do this. I'll propose to my manager or I'll do it myself. I'll just kill this task. I won't do it. Let's just figure out a better way to do this task. If that's the case, you know, like let's avoid it. Let's kill it. The other option you have is automate them. Now, it has never been easier in the history of humankind to automate something than it is right now. Right? If you look at what Google is doing what Facebook is doing, what Amazon is doing, what Apple is doing. All of the big tech companies, what they're focused on is automating things. And it's the same we're focused on in Swapi. Our team in Swapi is significantly smaller than, or our teams in general, significantly smaller than what you would find in an older company with the same revenue, right? And that's basically because we looked at, looked at these tasks and went like, okay, we can't kill it. We don't want to continue as is. We don't want to just, you know, can, can, can we automate this? And then the goal is to figure out how to automate it. And automation requires an upfront investment in time. But if you break it down, let's say you say, I spent 10 hours on automating this one task that I'm spending one hour every week on. Then it takes 10 weeks and then you're starting to pay dividends and that those 10 hours are upfront investment. And I can promise you, if you're talking about delivering impact, that's one of them or delivering value and making impact like that. That's one of them. That is if you figure out a task that can be automated. So the company saves time or you save time so you can do something else. Then the last one is you can delegate it. And this is always a bit of a touchy subject, but you will always be able to find someone who might have a passion for a task that you have zero passion for. Right. And, and they have the experience to deal with it. So in Swapia, for example, I'm no longer handling the influence and negotiations. I've delegated that to someone else because it doesn't make sense for me to spend time on it if I hate it and my time can be spent doing other stuff that brings more value. And again, this is a discussion that you all always have and it's always a touchy subject because delegating tasks is never not something people want to do in, in, in in traditional organizations or, or you will encounter it quite often. People are very happy with the tasks they have. Uh, and if you try to delegate them another task, they will be very resistant to do so, right? And then you either need to make a case for, we need to hire someone for it, or you need to make a case for, it doesn't make sense that I'm doing it. But it's always important to bring it up. Don't ever just be a yes man who, or yes woman who like just sits there and like nods and goes like, yes, yes, whatever you say, yes, let's do it. Yes, it makes sense. Nobody likes that. No manager likes that. No CEO likes that. Nobody likes that. 
speak the truth of saying, hey, I know this is my task, but it's draining me from energy. I'm less efficient and I don't have time for other valuable tasks. Can we please delegate this task to someone because we can't automate this process? And then, you know, it makes sense to do it. And then basically breaking down the last bit is you're not a one man show. If you talk about any entrepreneur, whether it will be a Danish one like Jesper Buk or Jeff Bezos or Larry Page or Sergey Brin or Elon Musk, whoever it is, they're not a one man show. Nobody is. They are successful because they've surrounded themselves with successful people as well. So it's important to recognize that you shouldn't idolize one single person and think I can do exactly the same as they can without the right people around you. That's, that's simply not going to happen. So it's important to recognize this, this element of saying, I am not a one man show. So I need to figure out how can I A, surround me by people that give me energy that are, you know, where we're working well together that are, you know, hopefully you should actually delegate, like surround yourself with people smarter than you. That's always what people say. And that's definitely true. But for me, for example, as a country manager, I have numerous other departments I have to talk with on a daily basis. I have to talk about finance, about budgets. I have to talk about operations, like how many phones can we sell? You know, what are like, what is the run rate on different phones? What can we expect in, in inventory? Payment and logistics, do we have the right payment solutions? Can we expand on the payment solutions? Are they working? Pricing, do we have the right price or not? Do we need to raise or lower it? Do we need to come up with a subscription service, whatever? Tech, they need to develop everything. Do we need to change our website? Creative, right? They, they, like they're all over the place. There's so many of these, and this is not all of them that I'm talking to on a daily basis. So for me, like this goes both ways, right? Each of these departments can either be a benefactor or a, an, an, an enemy in quotation uh, for, to me, right? If I don't help them, they're not gonna help me. It's that simple, it's how humans work. If you're constantly asking for things and you're giving nothing back, they're gonna be more and more reluctant to do it. And it might even be that you're actually, you know, you're the you're the manager, which is it, which it is in some cases. But that doesn't, you know, that still doesn't work. If you keep asking them for things without giving something in return, you're they're gonna leave. They're gonna jump ship. The same goes for all of these other departments. You need to offer them something for you to be able to offer something back. And that's recognizing that for you to function properly, properly every other team around you needs to function properly as well. Now, this seems, of, of course, super scary and like, oh, shit, what if I'm in like a company of a thousand people? Like, do I need, really need to give something to all of them? And no, of course not. But it's just worth recognizing that it, everything works better if it's a give and take relationship rather than a take or rather than a give. And you shouldn't be working with somebody where you're constantly giving them something and they're never giving you something back. Whether that, like, I'm not talking about deliverables like presentations or whatever it is, or data or whatever it is. It, I'm talking about it could be soft skills, it could be feedback, it could be anything else. There needs to be a, a, a symbiotic relationship here for you to be successful, for you to deliver impact. And it's also important to surround yourself with people because we have a tendency to have all of these unconscious biases. And if you're telling me right now that you don't have any unconscious biases, I'm gonna say you're full of shit because every single human person have. And it's important to recognize that every, like human error is a thing. Every single person makes mistakes. I can promise you the same goes for Jeff Bezos I can, and Elon Musk. Every single person makes mistakes. So it's important to recognize that and not just, first of all, hammer someone down because they're made a human error, it happens, but also recognize your own unconscious biases, right? Some of these examples are, for example, affinity bias, right? You have a tendency to surround yourself with like-minded people. It could be con confirmation bias. If you think something's true, you're more likely to go 
search for data that proves your point rather than objective data. Halo effect. If one, if you see this person who's wearing a suit and, and tie and they're dressed up all fancy and they're throwing around a lot of buzzwords and they have uh, uh, McKinsey or BCG on their, on their LinkedIn, we have this halo effect of thinking like this perfect, this, this person knows everything. They're so smart, right? Because there's this halo effect of this is like confirming your own biases again. So it's important to kind of not stop them completely because that's never going to happen, but be aware of them. And then lastly, like one of the other aspects is feedback is truly a gift, but everything in moderation, right? It's feedback, feedback, feedback. You need to constantly ask for feedback and you need to tell people that they need to tell you the truth. And this feedback matrix theory is something that I've been working with for quite a while now. It's not my invention, but I've been working with it for quite a while. And it's basically a matrix where for every meeting you've had, for every task that you've done, you sit across from the person who's worked with you on the task or sit across whoever you had a meeting with and you ask them, what is one thing I did well? What is one thing I can improve on? And then you give them that feedback back. One thing, what, what is one thing they did well? What is one thing that they can improve, right? Because if I start giving you feedback and I'm giving you four or five improvement areas, you're not gonna remember any of them. You might remember one of them. But if I only tell you one thing, then you remember that distinctly. And feedback needs to happen all the time. I think the most awkward feedback sessions I've had, uh, or at least the, the other parties felt it was awkward, was actually when I had when I was working at Google and I was having this meeting with a client and I was actually pitching them. I was pitching them a, a, a campaign that they should run on YouTube. And I asked them, like after the meeting, after it was done, and we kind of agreed on like the next action points and whatever, I stopped them up and I asked them like, so how did you find it? Could you give me some feedback on it? Like, what is one thing I did when, what is one thing I can improve on? And you'll be surprised about how awkward it is for like five seconds. And then afterwards it's super smooth. And there's no better feedback than the ones that you're actually selling to. Nobody rarely, every, everybody rarely does this. So this is where you really can set yourself apart and also really understand, especially when you're talking with clients about, you know, like they, they suddenly form a more human connection with you. You're not just selling them stuff. You're actively asking them for you to be better or for, you know, for, for, yeah, for, for yourself to, to improve basically. And then I want to talk about the myth of genius. Now, this is a screen grab of a YouTube video that's called The Myth of Genius by a YouTube channel that's called Wisecrack. I will highly recommend you to watch it. But it's important to recognize that just because a person is a genius in one area doesn't mean they're a genius in any other area. And this is one of the unconscious biases we have. Just because Elon Musk, Elon Musk has built this incredible company that's called Tesla, doesn't mean he understands virology. It doesn't mean that when he says that his factory should open during the middle of a global pandemic, doesn't mean that he knows that he's a genius in this area just because he's a genius in another. Same goes for anyone else. So it's important to recognize both yourself, you are not a genius in every area, you are not the brightest person in every area. And it's important to also recognize that the same goes for every person around you. And I think the last thing I want to say with this, when we're talking about geniuses and entrepreneurs and so on, every single person of these are so, to somewhat degree aware of what their, you know, what their faults are and what they're great at. And I think it's also important for you to recognize that you cannot be a genius in every single area. And another thing that was, that has been true for both uh, the, the venture I worked with, with Rocket Internet and Google and Swappy, is that nobody wants you to be good at what you're bad at. Everybody wants you to be great at what you're good at. You're not hired to be the best at everything. You're hired because you might turn out to be the best in one specific business area. I have studied finance. 
I think I'm intermediate at it, but I am by no means great at it. And that's not a requirement for my for what I want to do for the rest of my life. What I doing what I'm doing right now. So I don't need to train that muscle. Again, your you, if you look at brain, your brain again as a muscle, right? There's how an Olympic swimmer trains versus a bodybuilder versus a, a cyclist is completely different. They have completely different goals, but they're all excellent at that, that particular area that they're in, right? You're not seeing a person being the best at football, but at the same time being, you know, win winning Mr. Universe. You're not seeing a person, you're not seeing Lionel Messi, right? He is the, one of the greatest football players of all time but you're not seeing him play handball or follow the same regimen as handball because he doesn't need to. That's not his goal. And then I think the last bit of, of news is basically three points that I uh, didn't really know where to fit anywhere. So now you're getting them here. Um, basically the first one, the formula is a very basic formula. Basically you Nobody becomes better by being really, really good or training really, really hard for one day at a week. It's consistency always wins. So you always just need to be 1% better than you were yesterday, and you'll be close to 30, 38 times better than you were a year ago. And these can be little, little tiny things. So for example, for me, I spend a lot of time doing Google Sheets um spend a lot of different times like trying to figure out how google sheet work with like clicking my mouse all the time so i spent some time just one one day like one day at a time I'll say like okay today i'll learn one formula and sheet and i learned that formula and i try to use it a couple of times next day it's the next formula and then suddenly now i can do a task that would usually take me half a day i can do now in 30 minutes because i've learned the shortcuts so always just focus on small incremental boosts. Don't go for jumps like this. Go for like little ones like this all the time. The jumps don't work. And then passion beats experience. Passion is always the one thing that matters, right? So are you passionate about what you're doing? I can tell you that if you're not passionate about what you're doing, you're going to be overtaken by somebody who is. Might not be, even though you might be more experienced, even though you might have five years of more experience, might not be the first day, might not be the 10th day, might not be even in a year, but at some point, the person with a passion is going to overtake you. So always do what you're passionate about. And I'm not saying, you know, be an actor, be a rock star, right? Or something like that. I'm saying, figure out what you're doing in your daily life right now that you're passionate about and pursue that. I'm not talking about us all wanting to do um, like opening of muffin shops or whatever it is, right? It's, it's about figuring out what I like to do, for example, is to look at numbers from a high level perspective. I don't like nitty gritty details and deciding a strategy here. So figure out what you're passionate about. Like it doesn't need to be an industry, but it needs to be about the process that you're doing your input. And then manager always beats salary and prestige. If you're telling me that you want to work for Bain, Bain Capital, because uh, you want to work there for two years, and then you want to jump up and out to work in private equity. Why? Like, why, why go that way? And, and okay, you're going to Bain Capital. Why are you going to Bain Capital? Ah, uh, it's because it's one of the big three management consultancy firms that are focused on private equity. But then you're going for prestige. You have nothing else that you're focused on here. You're not focusing on what you're actually, you know, if you want to go into private equity, why do you want to go into private equity? So the most important thing here is to have a manager that understands you. So after you've basically chosen an industry or whatever you want to work in, Manager, like I always choose somebody I can understand who can mentor me. Again, I'm not a one-man show. A person who can mentor me properly, I will always take over 
anything else. I will always be happy to take a salary hit, of course, until a certain threshold, but always take a salary hit and then have a mentor and a coach that can help further my progress within what I'm passionate about.